Call the meeting to order. Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mr. Buckner? Here. Reverend Campbell? Here. Mr. Hood? Here. Mayor Jones? Here. Mr. Mayo? Here. Vice Mayor Miller? Here. Mr. Saunders? Here. Mr. Vogel? Here. Mr. Whittler? Here. We have our invocation by Councilman Larry Campbell, followed by a Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would please stand. Could we all bow our heads, please? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy that you have shined down upon us. When we look at country, we look at communities across our nation who have experienced mass shootings. But God, you've been so good to us. We don't take accidental, but our hearts go out for the people who are hurting right now and for their families. We pray tonight as we should come together and make decisions that will affect our people in this community, that you give us the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to move forward. In your name we pray, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to say good evening to those of you who are here in the chambers and those who are viewing us River City or in your homes, we will have communications from our visitors, citizens who desire to speak on matters not listed on the agenda will be heard this time. Citizens who desire to speak on agenda items will be heard when the agenda item is considered. Good evening to you, sir. Please state your name and your address for the record. Good evening. Hi, thank you, Mayor Jones. My name is Sean Barker. I live at 312 Marshall Terrace in Danville. And are you ready for me to speak now? Okay, um, we are, I am of, uh, I'm the president and founder of Save the Vax Movement, hashtag Save the Vax, kind of like the shirt. And um, we're here today to talk about some of the adverse reactions that people are experiencing as a result of COVID-19 vaccines, and to also give some hope because there are many wonderful medical professionals that are already working on protocols to help those who are having these adverse events. We would like for you to sort of take this matter seriously because we feel that the public needs to be duly warned so that people who may have disease that is uh, at this level imperceptible can go get tested and go find out uh, what type of adverse reactions may be developing inside their bodies to hopefully prevent the worst outcomes. So I have some prepared comments and then I'm going to sort of give you a tour of the packet that I distributed to all of you earlier this evening. And I do have two more copies if anyone else from the city needs them. We are on the cusp of a disaster, the likes of which we have never seen in America and for which we are ill-equipped and ill-prepared. The mainstream corporate media and the medical industrial complex are actively concealing vital information that consumers need to know with regard to adverse reactions up to and including death caused by COVID-19 vaccines. CDC VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, currently reports 29,162 deaths due to COVID-19 vaccines. That figure was from today. The figures on your packets are from two weeks ago. By point of comparison, the 1970s swine flu vaccine program was shut down and branded as a fiasco after just 450 cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome whereas this vaccine program continues despite all these adverse reactions. Columbia University researchers, Pontesantos and Seligman, and the, their study is included in your annotated bibliography in your packet, I'll point it out to you, conducted a 2021 study of all-cause mortality as a function of the vaccine rollout. They found that their results suggest that CDC VAERS only reflects about 5% of the true numbers of deaths and adverse events related to these experimental vaccines. If Pontesatos Pantizato, and Seligman are correct, the real death numbers are closer to 600,000 and counting nationwide. But the death statistics are only part of the problem. CDC also reports 15,006 heart attacks, 42,354 diagnoses of either myocarditis or pericarditis, 54,559 now permanently disabled due to the VAX, 4,771 miscarriages, 15,897 instances of Bell's palsy, 41,765 severe allergic reactions, 
9,739 episodes of anaphylactic shock due to the vax, 6,899 diagnosis of thrombocytopenia, 165,213 hospitalizations, 131,133 urgent care visits, 196,759 primary care visits due to vax-related illness. And keep in mind, if Pontazato's and Seligman are correct, times all those numbers by 20. And that gives us 26 million adverse events to the COVID vaccines just in the United States to date, based on 1.3 million reports to CDC. In Europe, it's 1.5 million. So what's more is that the vaccinosis disease appears to be progressive, causing its victims to develop inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, and AIDS. Many will also develop cancers, infertility, and neurological disorders. Now is the time to pull together as a community and make a disaster plan to handle this healthcare crisis, which is in truth already underway. You may notice that our 911 calls are increasing every month in Danville, every single month, and they're higher than they were in 2020 by at least 300. Unfortunately, many of the healthcare professionals that we typically rely on will themselves be victims and patients as the fullness of this situation hits us. We already have vaccine detox protocols, and some of the best medical minds on the planet are developing remedies to help the vaxxed. What we need now is real leadership, your leadership. Your time is up. I'll give you about 20 more seconds to sum it all up. Well, sir, I'm speaking on behalf of an organization, so that means I get 10 minutes according to the I website. the organization to please stand. Will your members to please stand? Must attorney give him uh, five more minutes, please. Okay. Thank you. Somebody have a seat. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we need someone to step up and be the hero here. We need one of you guys to step up and be a, a hero here. In your packet, I have included a list, list of resources for the vaxxed, a list of community education events to give you all and the public opportunities to learn more. The Singaporean protocol for vaccine detox, the FLCCCA post-vaccination protocol, and a 17-page annotated bibliography of 41 scientific sources, most of which are peer-reviewed and some of which are preprint, that demonstrate the toxicity of the vax. I look forward to meeting with all of you in the near future to further educate you about the importance of this issue and assisting with developing solutions for our beloved community. And I do believe there are solutions. I do believe there's hope. But people have to intervene early in order to prevent the worst outcomes. So I wanted to tell you what's in the packet. This is a printout of openvares.com. This data comes directly from CDC, but it's compiled in a user-friendly way. And the handwritten URL is how you can go back and check it. I personally save the VAX movement. We fact check this website about once a month to make sure that they're being accurate. And we compare them to data directly from CDC, wonder.cdc.gov. I personally do the fact check. The next page is, this is also from, this is also from Open Bears, and this shows you, this chart right here shows you. Bears has been around since 1990. These are all the deaths reported to Bears as a function of year, total Bears for all vaccines. And if you look at that page, you see 2021 and 2022, it, it went out of the water. There, these are already the deadliest vaccines in human history, already. This is a list of resources most of which uh, I personally wrote. And it's a, uh, four, I have uh, three DVAC, four DVAX manuals already, so with protocols on how to detox the vaccine and how to fix the issue. Uh, and I also have some rec reported, cla recorded classes that I put on Rumble so that people can follow along at home and figure out how to do it. The next page is a list of our community education events. Our, communication, our community education events will start in August and September. And you can see we're gonna do DVAX classes to teach people how to detox the VAX, and we're going to handle every aspect of this issue and do a full lecture on how, how we got into this mess and how we can get out of it. So I would hope to see some, if not all of you there. The next page is the Singaporean protocol for vaccine detox. This was developed by a group of doctors in Singapore, and it came to us by way of Joel Brown and Robert O. Young. 
This is the Frontline Critical COVID Care Alliance's iRecover po post-vaccine treatment protocol. So this one is the one that we're going to distribute to local health care providers because it's the most conceptually accessible to uh, the current medical paradigm, and it includes a lot of prescriptions that they will recognize. So we're going to distribute that to local health care providers to give them a heads up on what to look for for this. The next two pages, are these are the ones I most want you guys to read. What, as local legislators, what can you do to help? So what we want now is for people to be aware of this. We want a, a letter sent out to the public to warn them of the dangers and encouraging them to seek uh, attention to test for the different things that they can test for. Uh, but we also would like to see studies. We want our local population to be studied to see what percentage of people are having these bad adverse reactions so that we can know exactly what we're dealing with as a community. And then the next thing is, uh, a annotated bibliography that I personally wrote with 41 scientific studies, uh, including one uh, hyperlinked bibliography of 1,011 uh, peer-reviewed studies that all point toward vax toxicity, and I did my best to choose the most important ones. And finally, I have um, a page for uh, ways for you guys to contact us, but we will be following up with an email, and we would hope to, we hope that you guys may advocate so that we can come and give you our full presentation, because we feel it's very important that you all, as our local leaders and as our local legislators, know everything that we know about this so that you can respond appropriately. And if you all have questions for me, I'd be more than happy to take them. Yeah, I want to thank you and your colleagues for being here. Stand up one more time. We met you all earlier. We appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you so much. Any questions? None at all. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, you so much. Take care. We're still in communications. Any citizen who desires to speak on matters not listed on the agenda will be heard at this time. Citizens who desire to speak, on a, please state your name, your address for the record, and good evening to you, ma'am. Good evening. My name is um, Candy Edwards. I'm from Youth and Positive Action. Um, I want to just give, oh, just give those give those to the city manager or city attorney and go to the microphone so our audience can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, always a little bit nervous. Just I'm That's new with right. this. Um, once again, I've come to y'all. I want to invite all of your Tyler Perry is presenting one of his plays that's going to be in Danville at the end of July. I've handed out flyers, so I would like to invite all of you to please attend to come. It's called Sanctified. It's going to be on July 30th. And also in October, at the behest of the mayor, he gave me some suggestions to adjust something that I had did for the second flyer. And I, I made those adjustments for you, mayor, for the youth to attend. Did, did you adjust them for me or did you adjust them for you? <laughs> I just, at your suggestion, I should, you Very put it good. to my attention, so I adjusted it. It's Very the cancer good. event that I hold each year. Um, this year I'm bringing Keith Washington, Marvin Gaye's sister. I just want to let the city of Danville know that Tyler Perry is looking at us and I just want to invite you all to please, please come out and support. I'm inviting all of you to come because this is something wonderful that Tyler Perry is doing in the city of Danville. I appreciate you all. I really want to support. Once again, my name is Candy Edwards. I am the CEO and founder of Youth and Positive Action. If you have any questions, you can call me. I'm open. Brian has been so wonderful and gracious to help me. Barry has been helping me. And I just thank you all for supporting me because this is a lot of work. I mean, this is really, and I really enjoy my city. I just want you all to support me with this, with this happening in Danville. Thank you. Well, Holly, before you leave, we yep. want to have thank any you. Questions? You mentioned Barry and, and, and Bryant. Yes. We appreciate what you do in our city. You say you appreciate your city. We appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You brought, you brought who did you bring last year? Last year I bought Hattie Mae. Hattie Mae. I bought and Hattie Mae. She was from Tyler Perry show. Yes, too. from Tyler. So this year it'd be Keith Washington, Marvin Gaye's sister, Jovan Johnson from the Oval. Going too fast. Keith Johnson. Keith who? Keith Washington, Keith Kissing Washington. You. That's back in the day. You know about Kissing You. You know Keith, about that. Keith Washington and who else? Z uh, Marvin Gaye's sister, Ziola Gay. This is sister that I'm bringing. Along, and Jovan Johnson will be back again. And two other, they said they tried to make it for Tyler Perry. They just want to show the support and let Danville know that we we watching you. We'll give you a name and your contact information again so persons who want to reach out to you can. All right. Thank you so much. Give your name and your oh, I'm sorry. contact it's information. It's Candy again. Edwards. Youth and Positive Action. My number is on the flyer. It's 434-203-4295. My email is youthandpositiveaction at yahoo.com. Well, good. Thank you so much for what you're doing in our community. All right. Thank, thank you. you. We're still in citizens who desire to speak on matters not listed on the agenda. will be heard at this time. Anyone else desire to speak, please come forward and state your name, your address for the record, and good evening to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name you is Alex. You can lift that up if you want yeah, to. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, my name is Alex Hatwick. I live at 524 West Main Street. Um, 
I uh, moved back here. I'm a 2014 graduate of Averett University. Uh, moved back here uh, in October of last year. Uh, currently work over at the Institute. Love it here. Very happy to be back. Love what you guys are doing. Um, this, I, I lived here in 2009. And I live here now, and it's way better than 2009. This place is. You, Say that again. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I lived here uh, right after the, the mill took off, and, and to see the. The turnaround has been has Councilman been Bowman amazing. Councilman Bowman is going to give you, guys you a Comeback City T-shirt. Keep talking like you yes, talk. Sir. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, in uh, the fall of 2020, I purchased some land through you guys, actually, um, in this chamber. Uh, and uh, I keep the grass cut, and I sort of uh, have been working to keep it in good shape. Um, I've done a whole lot of uh, tree work um, with just sort of like a ladder and a bow saw, just kind of trying to get things to where they need to be. Um, I do have, this is at the intersection of Stokes Street and Ryzen Street. This is, uh, at that intersection, it is the northwest corner of the street. Um, I do have a couple of trees that are overhanging the power lines, and I don't really know who to talk to about that. Um, I'm also experiencing a whole lot of litter and illegal dumping, specifically tires, um, on that property. And I was just kind of curious to see, uh, first of all, what a city council meeting looks like, and uh, I'm happy to see it. It looks what, really good. What, and for, uh, what, what, I can, uh, what I can do to help, and, and maybe what you could do to help me. Well, first of all, let it, I'm sure every council member is thinking what I'm about to say. Welcome home. Thank yes, you, sir. Welcome home. We Happy appreciate be you being a, we're trying to bring our young people back home. And I like the way you gave the litany how you came back. Yes, sir. And you're engaged and you're involved in your city. On that podium is a card, if you look on that card, to the city manager, to your right, to your left, right, there's sitting, those two guys right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, city manager, Ken Lark, and, and deputy city manager, Earl Reynolds. I think you gave it a lot. I saw them over there writing down as you were talking. They okay. will help you. And at the same time, I hope you spend time with them learning more about what your legislative body does because very impressive young man. And thank you so much for being here Thank tonight. you, sir. Happy to be back. Thank you. We're still in communication. Anyone who desires to speak on any item that's not on the agenda may come forward at this time. Anyone who desires to speak on any item not on the agenda may come forward at this time. Under the consent agenda, I open the public hearing. Any citizen who desires to speak on any item on the consent agenda may come forward at this time. Any citizen who desires to speak on any item under the consent agenda may come forward at this time. I close the public hearing. Council, what's your pleasure? Councilman Buck. May I like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda, uh, items A through E. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Campbell. Discussion of the motion? Discussion of the motion? Yes, yeah, so I got it. Councilman Whittle. Sure. Um, um, and I guess this is a question for Clark, too. If um, if we voted, if it, if we voted down, does that have does that codify the last meeting that we had? The, the consent agenda does that codify the last? Uh, what I'm asking about is the is the um, uh, in the budget on the uh, uh, on the school funding. Um, for simple reason is uh, the mayor gave an appointment out to. Councilman Campbell and I, and after listening to um, Councilman Saunders um, and his passion about the school system, that um, we need to be able to work with the uh, school system um, as diligently as possible. My my concern is is that. Well, my, or my statement is, is that it would be easier for us to work for them as, if we could fund them as we went on. And if we voted this down, does that finish their budget for them? Does that? No, no, no sir. The, uh, the appropriation that you voted on at the last meeting was what fully funded them, and it, it'll be funded over over time. These are all things related to grants and other uh, expenditures by the city itself, and I don't think there's anything in here that has anything to do, quite frankly, with the with the school. So, so the the the, the appropriation budget is what what 
what what funded that and there's not really a, a way to go back now we've changed physical years fiscal years not really a way to go back on that okay so it would I, I guess it would have been the point where we approved the last budget is I mean would would did we would we have voted on that or I mean I know we voted it um, I guess on the consent agenda would have been um, making sure that we had um, On, on the on the budget and the appropriation, we never vote those in the consent agenda. We always do those, each one of those, each one as a separate first reading, and then each one is a separate approval uh, or consideration. So there, we never make those part of the consent agenda. Thank you. Councilman Saunders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to say that at the last meeting, when we voted uh, on the total budget of the city, the school budget was in that total budget. I had some concerns that I had expressed about the school system for the last six to eight years. So for me to make my feelings known, I had to vote against the entire budget because the school budget was in it. And that's why I did that. But thank you, Mr. Whittle. Yes, sir. Thank I appreciate you. that. Yeah. Thank you both. Councilman Vogler. Yeah, and actually Councilman Saunders just touched on what I was just going to reiterate to to folks who, who didn't know or maybe forgot is that in, it actually the school budget vote itself was a few a couple meetings ago the last meeting and, and budget we voted on was for the entirety of the city and councilman saunders as he just mentioned voted that way because the previous meeting he had a, a personal situation and wasn't and so he wanted the opportunity to do it but the actual school budget was voted on yeah. a couple meetings ago and doesn't have anything to do with the consent agenda that we're voting on tonight Thank you. But, Thank you. Um, Clark, I just want to follow up on Councilman Whittle for future references. Uh, Councilman Whittle made a good point. When the budget, total budget appropriation that for the city and included the school system, if when we got time for the vote and, for instance, Councilman Whittle made a motion to say um, no at this time and all council members voted no after that budget had been presented, with the total, with the school system being in that budget, what would have happened? The shutdown. Say it again, speaking to you, Mike. We would have shut down because there would be no money to fund any, any government. And Ken, what was the timeline to Councilman Whittle's point? When we do our final budget appropriation, if by chance the total budget appropriation um, would have been, would not have passed, to, if you can ditto and add to what Clark is saying, and Councilman Widow, thank you for future references for bringing it up, because I didn't think about that. Uh, if it doesn't pass the night of a regular scheduled council meeting, then typically, uh, and it's not happened as long as I've been here, but typically what other jurisdictions have had to do is call a special meeting before June 30th or on June 30th, for example, and try to adopt a budget that everyone can agree to at that point. So basically, we have plenty of time. We, 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 we adopt the total budget, and I don't mean to counsel, I don't mean to ride on this because it's a good point. We uh, adopt our budget the middle of June before the 30th. It gives us more time. Yes, there's an option there. So there's time to, if you can't get enough votes, then you had time to work out whatever differences there might be. Is there, uh, uh, Councilman Saunders? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to Mr. Whitfield and to Mr. Manager, I think the school system get they get funds from the states other than the city. The city put in about twenty two, twenty, twenty two million dollars, okay? Uh, general and capital appropriation. What are the total school budget? The fifty four million, sixty million, do we know? Yes. Um, if off the top of my head I think it's in that range. That in the just, range? Yeah, this is what you said, yes. Okay, so Mr. Whitfield, make sure that I'm clear if City Council did not put the 20 million into that 50 some million budget. You said the school was shut down? Well, uh, the question is, I understood it is if Council did not pass the appropriation oh, measure okay. that would shut down. You have a certain minimum that you're required by law to give, and, and the state would require you to do that. Um, just as a matter, and just, just in passing, I, I, and I'm sure. Um, uh, Mr. Saunders will remember this. Since I've been city attorney, that's happened twice, where the appropriation and what 
to everybody did is went back and worked the numbers, kind of agreed on the numbers, and then we've had a special meeting called as late as like June 29th, which is cutting it close because the fiscal year starts July 1st, and if you don't have a budget on July 1st, there's no, there's no money to, to pay anybody and everything shuts down. Councilman Saunders, back to you. Uh, well, yes, I, I don't want to relive uh, anything. Education is the city's number one priority. And I made that, I said that. That was a quote. But there were some people associated with the schools who didn't seem to believe that. And I was just concerned about it because we said it for years. We had a retreat. We voted on it. And I asked several questions, and I didn't get satisfactory response. And my concern, I know Mr. Vogel used the word personal, but my concern goes back six to eight years, and I've been trying. And so in order for me, you know, for to thine own self be true, for me to, to deal with that, I voted my conscience. And my conscience is still clear. And yes, education is the number one priority in our school system, and I certainly wish the best for our children and their families. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So back to you, Councilman Whittle. Just uh, how much is that, Clark, that we uh, have to fund? What is the minimum we yeah, have to fund the correct. school system? Let me, let me put it this way. Uh, Ken, we're giving the school system what at this time? It's about 23 million for operations. 23 million. Is that in kind also, sir? Is that in kind also? That's a, that's a, uh, no, it's all cash. So what's, what's the total? So the 23 million, Councilman Campbell, um, so let me get mad, it's Councilman Whittle's question. 23 million, then I'm coming to you, Council. 23 million, what does the state say we have to fund? What do, what is, what, what do we have to fund, Ken? Uh, there, there is a formula, and I just don't have it off the top of my again. head. I'm sorry. So about 16, 16, 15, 16. Councilman Campbell, what was your question again? What is the total figure with the in-kind services, sir? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we partner on various things, but we, I don't know if we've quantified the any value to you the You explain this to the citizen what I'm talking about in reference to in-kind and cash. Well, do you, so we have, um, we have an operational budget. We also provide capital funds each year, so, um, and then we have to pay debt service. So are you talking about one of those categories? Um, Let, let's take capital. Let's take capital, because that's, uh, or carryover funds. If you add the carryover funds to, that we allow them to hold, add that to that. Well, uh, that varies every year, but we uh, don't anticipate there being much this year, but two million in capital uh, is what was in the budget for the current year. Uh, and then I forget exactly how much in debt service, but it's a few million dollars in debt service payments that we make every so year. So we get 23 million plus the, uh, add that, what you just added. Two million for- And then add the 1% sales tax, what that is gonna bring in. Uh, the 1% sales tax, I believe was gonna bring in like 115 to 120 million dollars. Yeah, something okay. like that. Well, Councilman Whittle, go back to you. So, uh, and it's good to get this figured out now because this, um, um, we're going to do everything we can to get with the uh, um, with the school board and uh, with the superintendent to um, um, help and lift it up, whatever, whatever we can do. But we're a bit powerless because they're their own elected officials, and. Um, I just need to know all the parameters that this council stays in when it comes 12 months from now. Thank you. I'm glad you asked your question. I'm coming to you, Councilman Vogler, because going forward, um, Ken and Larry and Madison, thank you both for serving again. I think it's very important that before we get to the final adoption of the budget next year in June, that if there is some discussions to what um, my attorney said, they had to go in special session, I'm hoping that those conversations could take place way before it comes time for us. But Councilman Volker. Yeah, and, and a great discussion. Um, I, I just want to make sure for those who are watching at home, because they don't have the agenda in front of them like we do, and they're probably tuning in wondering, we're talking a lot about schools and, and what's going on and what we're about to vote on. What we're about to vote on in the consent agenda, it's, it's a couple grants uh, from DRF and then um, uh, another uh, budget appropriation ordinance from Virginia Tourism Cooperation, and then the minutes from the last meeting. 
So that's what we're about to vote on. But I, the, the conversation about the schools is great. I just want to make sure somebody's not tuning in and thinking we're, we're having a vote about school budgets and, and all these kind of things, because that's, that's not in the consent agenda. So. Also, if you're tuning in, you may have missed the question from a council member. The question on the floor from a council member was from Councilman Whittle, if you're just tuning in, in regards of the final adoption of the budget, a school board budget, the total budget, which we approved at the last minute, and this question was not. Councilman Saunders. I think, Mr. Mayor, that was one of the main points that I've been talking about for three to five years now, asking for a three-year plan, or five years, but at least three. That way, we will know three years in a row what we commit to the schools, and we don't have to have all the debates, all these debates. And I asked for the plan and didn't get it and kept asking for it and didn't get it. We would not be having this discussion right now if we had that plan. We would have known, the schools would have known what they're gonna get the next year, the year after that. Simple question, what do you need for the next three years so when we vote two years from now or four years from now, we knew two years in advance and four years in advance. To me, it makes sense. You have all the numbers, all the numbers. What do you need so we can plan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Madam, Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mr. Buckner? Aye. Reverend Campbell? Aye. Mr. Hood? Aye. Mayor Jones? Aye. Mr. Mayo? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Mr. Saunders? Mr. Vogler? Aye. Mr. Whittle? Aye. On the old business, consideration of fee increases effective July 6, 2022. Council, what's your pleasure? Councilman Buckner. May I like to make a motion that we approve an ordinance amending and establishing certain rental fees of the City of Danville effective July 1st, 2022, final adoption. Second by Councilman Mayo. Discussion of the motion. Madam, uh, Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Reverend Campbell. Aye. Mr. Hood. Aye. Mayor Jones. Aye. Mr. Mayo. Aye. Vice Mayor Miller. Aye. Mr. Saunders. Aye. Mr. Vogler. Aye. Mr. Whittle. Aye. Mr. Buckner. All right. On the new business, consideration of amending the zoning ordinance of the City of Danville regarding outdoor lighting and illumination regulations. I open the public hearing. Anyone desire to speak on this agenda item may come forward at this time. Anyone who desires to speak on this agenda item may come forward at this time. I close the public hearing. Council, what's your pleasure? Councilman Buck. May I'd like to make a motion that we approve an ordinance repealing, replacing, and reordaining Article 15 entitled Outdoor Lighting and Illumination Regulations of Chapter 41 entitled Zoning Ordinance of the Code of the City of Danville, Virginia, 1986, as amended. Second by Councilman Whittle. Discussion of the motion. Councilman Vogler. Yeah, who, uh, who will come up and answer questions about this? All right, I'll give you a second. I looked through the packet and I think I got a pretty good grip on, on what all this is, but um, can you give us the, um, the, the condensed version of what this means for, for folks? Is it making it easier? Is it making it harder? What's the short version of it? The short version is technology went faster than the zoning code could. When the zoning code was written, you were still using incandescent light bulbs, halogen, and other things. And now everything's LED. So none of the numbers that we had matched, the actual outputs, we had things in wattages that a 60 watt LED versus a 60 watt incandescent are completely different. So our zoning code actually allowed overlighting of properties and sometimes required overlighting. So we've just changed this to uh, be more energy efficient and match what's currently out there. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mr. Hood? Aye. Mayor Jones? Aye. Mr. Mayo? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. Mr. Saunders? Aye. Mr. Vogler? Aye. Mr. Whittle? Aye. Mr. Buckner? Aye. Reverend Campbell? Aye. Consideration of a special use permit at 726 Temple Avenue. I open the public hearing. Anyone desires to speak on this agenda item may come forward at this time. Anyone desires to speak on this agenda item may come forward at this time. I close the public hearing. Councilman Vogler. Yes, Mayor, I move we adopt an ordinance granting special use permit application PZ22-106 filed by Stephen Decker for a duplex residential dwelling as allowed by Zoning Code Article 3E entitled OTR Old Town Residential District Section C entitled Uses by Special Permit Item 2 at 726 Temple Avenue, parcel ID number 24611. 
Second by Councilman Mayo, discussion of the motion. Madam, must the attorney? <laughs> let me just pause and let everyone know that That's our best, clerk you know. <laughs> is with her family, uh, Sue's. And we're praying for you, Sue. If you can tell, I miss you because I keep calling Mr. <laughs> Attorney, Madam Clerk. Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mayor Jones. Aye. Mr. Mayo. Aye. Vice Mayor Miller. Mr. Saunders. Mr. Fogler. Aye. Mr. Whittle. Aye. Mr. Buckner. Aye. Reverend Campbell. Aye. Mr. Hood. Aye. Consideration of rezoning property on North Main Street. I open a public hearing. Anyone desires to speak on this agenda item may come forward at this time. Anyone desire to speak on this agenda item may come forward this time. I close the public hearing. Councilman Campbell. Mr. Mayor, I move for adopting the ordinance appropriating, approving and authorizing the rezoning of a 0 0.069 acre portion of the property on North Main Street, parcel number 53608 and 604.97 from Light Economic Development Industrial LED-1 to Highway Retail Commercial HR-C. Second by Councilman Buckner, discussion of the motion. Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mr. Mayo? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. Mr. Saunders? Aye. Mr. Vogler? Aye. Mr. Whittle? Aye. Mr. Buckner? Aye. Reverend Campbell? Aye. Mr. Hood? Aye. Mayor Jones? Aye. Consideration of approving the Mass Transit Equal Employment Opportunity Plan. Councilman Campbell? Mr. Mayor, I move for considering the appropriating the Mass, I'm sorry, Resolution authorizing the city manager to approve Danville Transit Equal Employment Opportunity Plan. Second by Councilman Buckner. Discussion of the motion. Can someone help me out with that, please? Someone can help Councilman Whittle. I could start why, while our uh, transportation director comes up, but uh, according to, I believe it's um, federal requirements, uh, if we have more than 50 employees within transit, we're required to have one of these plans. Councilman Saunders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, Mr. Manager, with regard to the uh, EEO plan, the Transportation Department is one department of the city. Does the city have this overall EEO policy? We don't have one as comprehensive as this. We have, we have some policies related to it, but nothing as comprehensive as what's being required for the transit because we get federal funds for the transit system and they're over 50 employees or at least 50 employees within transit. So we have an option in terms of whether we adopt one or not? Uh, you don't have, well, in order to accept federal funds for the transit system, you don't have an option. They'll just not give us the funds um, for the transit system. But as far as citywide, we, we have no requirement to do one as comprehensive as the one that is being required for the transit system. And not a debate uh, tonight, Mr. Mayor. But, um, Mr. Manager, can you help me understand why, why we don't have a citywide EEO plan? Not tonight, but at some point, some information on that, because I, I mean, federal governs state and local and everything else, and I, I was just not aware of the fact we didn't have a local EEO plan. We do have policies, um, but we don't have one as comprehensive <laughs> as what is being required here. But we do have policies related to it, but I can give you more detail. Thank you, sir. Yep. Mark wants to... Yeah, um, one reason is that we have to track, as part of this plan, we have to track every individual that files an application. And if you can imagine doing that for thousands and thousands of applications, it would be extremely administratively heavy. So anybody that's promoted, anybody that goes through training, anybody that's fired, anybody that receives disciplinary action, it all has to be tracked with respect to minority with respect to the protected groups that are, that are identified in the council letter. It, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, monitoring. Mr. Mayor, just one follow-up. Uh, Mr. Um, Manager, we get grants from the states a lot of times. We get supplemental grants from the federal as well. We have local departments and different, et cetera. So if they're matched, with federal funds. Do we still need an EEO plan if they are matched with federal funds? Some some local, some state, and some federal. So we're working through some of that. It's, it seems like it's a new thing that's come down uh, recently. Uh, that, and so that we've, as we've been getting some grants, 
I've been asked uh, at least on one more occasion to either certify that there are less than 50 employees within that work unit or more, and if depending on what the answer is, I'd have to either we'd have to put together an EEO plan as comprehensive as the one for transit uh, or not. Uh, so it, it really, it's, it seems to be something that is new that we're working our way through, um, but uh, it, I, I can certainly get you more information on it. It's probably, okay. it's pretty complicated. Okay. We're trying La to figure it out. <laughs> All right, last comment, Mr. Mayor. Um, the world is changing. And with the, uh, with the change, a lot of federal resources are being made available in all 50 states, and quite frankly, outside of the United States, but in all 50 states. And uh, if Danville is eligible to receive some funds to meet some need that we have, I certainly hope that we have what the federal government said we need to get that money, because things are changing, and we're going to need a whole lot more than we have now. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank, Thank, manager. You. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my, uh, Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Vice Mayor Miller. Aye. Mr. Saunders. Aye. Mr. Vogler. Aye. Mr. Whittle. Aye. Mr. Buckner. Aye. Reverend Campbell. Aye. Mr. Hood. Aye. Mayor Jones. Aye. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Consideration of a moral obligation for the White Mill Development Councilman Vogler. Yes, Mayor, I move we adopt a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a moral obligation agreement by and between the City of Danville, Virginia and American National Bank and Trust Company. Second by Vice Mayor, discussion of the motion. Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mr. Saunders? Aye. Mr. Vogler? Aye. Mr. Whittle? Aye. Oh. Mr. No, did he? He said no. Okay. Mr. Buckner? Yes. Reverend Campbell? Aye. Mr. Hood? Aye. Mayor Jones? Aye. Mr. Mayo? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. Consideration authorizing the removal of the Long Mill Dam, Vice Mayor? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, have a resolution authorizing removal of the Long Mill Dam located in the Dan River adjacent to the YMCA. Second by Councilman Mayo. Discussion of the motion. Councilman Vogel. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, we've discussed this issue for 10 years now, uh, roughly, ever since uh, this dam was donated to the city. And I kind of chuckle when I say donate. I, I, you got to kind of love a donation that might end up costing you about a million dollars by the time it's all said and done. Uh, but my position has been consistent and clear on this. I, I don't support removing this dam because to me, there are still simply too many unknowns that haven't been answered over these last 10 years. Uh, and quite frankly, probably can't be answered. Um, I've heard it been mentioned that we would be returning the river to its natural state. But what really is the natural state of the river when this dam has existed for over 120 years? And if you want to know what the river looked like, that stretch of the river looked like before that dam was built, there's actually documentation of it. The Corps of Engineers had a report in 1880, which is before that dam was built, that shows in great detail what that stretch of river looked like without that dam being there. And in that report, it says the depth of the river in that stretch ranged anywhere from three-fourths of one inch to three feet deep. So in sections of it, it was less than an inch deep in this stretch of water that we're talking about in front of the White Mill. No current in-depth analysis has been done to show what the, the depth of, of that river will look like when the dam is removed, but the city has done some preliminary um, research or, or uh, observation of it, and even by their own uh, research and, and says uh, that there will be a large number of rocks, large rocks exposed uh, throughout that stretch of river. And I know for many years that, that this notion of if we remove the dam, folks will be able to kayak up and down the river, wherever they want to go. And you've seen pictures of kayaks floating through the river and around the, uh, around the White Mill and, and all that. If the dam was gone, people could kayak as much as they want. But you just heard there's going to be huge, <coughs> jagged rocks all through that stretch. The water is going to be anywhere from an inch to maybe a couple feet deep. So uh, the notion of kayaking through there is a fantasy. Now, if the dam ends up coming down, you know, if that's the vote, look, I respect everybody down here, but let's be honest about people. I don't want people thinking that they're going to be kayaking all through there. It's simply not going to happen. They won't be kayaking. They might be rock climbing. 
Over the last several years, hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested, both public and private, in our River District. It is, without a doubt, a major success story in our city. Um, the, one of the more recent developments that will be happening, we talk about it a lot, is, is the Riverfront Park. It's exciting. I'm excited about it. I'm very excited about it. I'm excited about everything that's happening down there. But if you look at what that river looked like before the dam and potentially could look like when the dam is removed, I'm afraid we won't have a Riverfront Park. We may have a Puddle Front Park. I'll be voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Campbell. Yes, uh, if uh, Ken could maybe address a few questions, I appreciate it. I want to have a full understanding of my perception of the dam and the white mill. Would the dam be completely demolished or be partial? Completely demolished. Okay, so I was talking somewhere and I thought for the hydraulics to lift the water up on the canal, could you explain what's going to, how that's going to be done? Sure, it'll be the Union Street Dam. So that's not the dam that's under consideration for removal. The Union Street Dam will provide the hydraulics necessary to uh, power the proposed Whitewater Canal. Okay, so what Whitewater me Vogel is talking about, that is going to be hydraulic to lift that water, right? Uh, the, yeah, the, the Union Street Dam will continue to have water backed up against it, and there are uh, gates there that can be opened and closed that let water into the canal, which will then will be repurposed as a whitewater channel. But the, the thank you, thank you, Dr. Miller. Yeah, uh, our, you know, ten years ago, uh, a little boy drowned down river on one of these low head dams. I raised the contention they are dangerous. They remain dangerous. People continue to drown. Once we get the riverfront park, it'll be like a, a beacon uh, that people will be able to walk out of the riverfront park right to the foot of that dam if it's still there. We'll have more drownings. But the other thing that's come up which has changed is the project. If we're going to develop the kayak, the, the white mill, the, the river walk trail in, in front of the white mill, the new bridge uh, we're developing, all these permits depend on that dam coming down. So we're going to, you know, um, it's an economic thing too now. And I don't want to put economics ahead of public safety. Um, but this, there's a big economic issue here. Uh, it'll change the floodplains and so forth. Uh, again, downstream when the Brantley Dam was removed, the river, uh, I, I don't see any difference. I've looked at it numerous times. You can't tell any difference in the flow of water down in that area. Um, so there's additional reasons now, besides public safety, which is my priority, is economic development, proper economic development of that area. It depends on the dam being removed. So why do we keep something that's a public menace uh, and sacrifice the economic development? Uh, we've put millions into the white mill um, development. Um, we need to give a priority to that as well. So, uh, and as far as fish, uh, you know, the fish and game and inland fisheries has said that the fish will do better. Uh, they'll spread out more, they'll grow larger. Uh, dams impede the size of fish and the number of fish. And plus, they can't get upstream. Uh, so uh, there's numerous reasons we need to remove these dams. And uh, they're coming down all over the East Coast, these low-head hydraulic dams. Uh, Union Street is not a low-head dam. Schoolfield Dam is not a low-head dam. They don't have nearly the danger. It's safer to go over the uh, Schoolfield Dam as high as it is. You have better chance of surviving than going over one of these low-head dams and get caught in the hydraulics. Believe me, I've been caught in hydraulics kayaking on a river in Olachucky, and I was scared. I wasn't going to get out of it. It's frightening. You cannot. I don't know how I escaped. But anyway, for all these reasons, I'll be voting for removal of the dam. Thank you. Councilman Saunders. I think, Mr. Mayor, I think uh, Mr. Whitfield and I have been here about the same length of time, about 24 years. And I've been hearing about this for about 24 years with City Council. Now, for me in, individually, uh, yes, it's, it's a matter of a safety. It's also a matter of private investment. Okay, more private investment. One death is too many. Yes, we've had one. Actually, we've had two, but one is too many. But it's not only fear, I believe it leads to the growth 
of the future of our city. I'm looking forward to uh, the park uh, being by the river. I'm looking forward to the white mill being further developed. I'm looking for other developments being made, private sector as well as public. So, Mr. Mayor, um, I will be supporting this. Mr. Attorney, call the roll, please. Mr. Vogler? No. Mr. Whittle? No. Rev uh, Mr. Buckner? No. Reverend Campbell? Aye. Right. Mr. Hood? Yes. Mayor Jones? Yes. Mr. Mayo? Yes. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mr. Saunders? Yes. The the item Councilman Buck, you had a question? Oh, on item G, consideration to amend the fiscal year 2023 budget appropriation ordinance for tobacco revitalization funds for construction of a shell building in Cyber Park. Councilman Buck. May I like to make a motion that we approve an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2023 budget appropriation ordinance for the Southern Virginia Program Grant number 3360 in the amount of $1 million from the Virginia Tobacco Regional Revitalization Commission and appropriating the same first reading. Second by Councilman Mayo, first reading. Communication, City Manager. I have nothing this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Deputy City Manager. Thank you, sir. City Attorney. Uh, nothing this evening, Mr. Mayor. We call the roll, please. Mr. Whittle. Um, yeah, so uh, that's all I got tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Buckner. Yeah, I'd like to say a big congratulations to uh, Britton Beltrain. She's a, a, a local girl who's making a big name for herself in the, the world of bare knuckle boxing. She fought last weekend and won um, down in uh, uh, Florida, Orlando, Florida. Oh, I'm sorry, not Orlando. Uh, some, somewhere down there in Florida. Uh, did a great job. She very well represented Danville. Every time she comes out and uh, enters the ring, she, uh, she mentions Danville. And she's just, uh, just, we're just very happy for her and congratulate her on all her success, her and her husband. Her husband is Joey Beltram, who was the MMA heavyweight champion for several years. Um, and, and, and they train right here in Danville at Lux Boxing Gym right there on Main Street. But also uh, got this in an email today. I'm sure I'm going to cut some of you guys off with this, but it's my turn. So, <laughs> uh, Museum um, at the Danville Museum of Fine Arts and History. Uh, Museum meets Margarita fundraiser. So it's Margaritaville fundraiser, and that's July 16th from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, you can reach out to the uh, museum or anybody you know that may be on the board at the museum for tickets. It's $40 in advance and $50 at the gate. Um, there's music, uh, silent auction, food, uh, door prizes, and it's uh, all kind of stuff. It's a great event for a great organization, and that's July 16th from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, Mr. Manager, I'd also like to thank you and all of our staff for an absolutely phenomenal evening last night. Everybody in this room today has heard from their constituents last night and all day. And um, if you were anywhere near the River District last night, you could hear the cheers and the clapping and the laughter and the, the buzz that was just going on around here. And as a city councilman, and as, <coughs> well, not as a city councilman, as a Dan Billion, that made me very, very, very happy and very proud to know that uh, folks around here are enjoying themselves right here in our city. And uh, uh, I'll, I won't take Mr. Mayor's thunder, but he was telling a story earlier about some folks he met. And um, people are watching, man. As, as, as Councilman Saunders has told me since day one, man, the world is watching. People are watching, and they're paying attention to what we're doing here. And thank you guys so much for the amazing night that you put on for everybody. Bill, stand up. Let us give you another hand. Stand up, Bill. I know you don't want to, but stand up. Just give him another <laughs> hand. Back to you, Mr. Attorney. <clears throat> Reverend Campbell. Uh, I have to pick it back off, off of you. Last night was just exceptional. The fireworks was something else. And I really did, did enjoy it. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I had my father out last night. He just got excited. <laughs> so I was just blessed. And Don't get too excited. <laughs> we see the atmosphere. It's something, it's something good in the atmosphere. That's called good quality of life. Yeah. So we are very appreciative of where we are in Danville. 
and where we are moving toward in the future. Uh, yesterday, I had a glorious experience to go by ACE, uh, Youth Enhancement Program by our dear brother and councilman, Brian Hood. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed, and I hope that uh, he will talk about it tonight a little bit. I'm not going to steal your thunder, but he has some young people there and all different ages, and I'm just <clears> so <throat> proud of what you're doing. just wanted to say that. Now, um, Mr. Mayor, before I, I shut up, uh, you know, with Councilman Willard hitting on the schools and myself, I see that Kenny Lewis is doing a special program this summer where it's called uh, Six Books Summer Reading Program. And in order for us to move up on that scale, we have to enhance our reading within our youth. It takes a village. It takes us coming together. And uh, each child, I ask them to read six books, and you can pick it up from 52 different reading sites, tutorial, tutorial program by Kenny Lewis, and also I'm thankful for our superintendent. They're working hand in hand together. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, great report, thank you. Mr. Hood? Uh, yes, um, if I may, uh, thank you, um, Reverend he, Campbell. He, he, he's gonna pay me for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, actually, I did wanna just touch on what our ACE Academy is. It's a program within the Statehood Foundation. And what we're doing, we're doing an eight week program that gives some expertise in music, writing, photography, and fashion. So what we're doing is we're showing them not only collaborating, because what they're doing is uh, the main structure of it is music, but it's three components that's up under the music that you combine together, which is fashion, writing, and photography. So all of it will be combined together. So what they're doing is actually putting together a music program where they're actually making a single. So they're making a single. They'll be able to go to um, fashion studios, They'll be going to music studios. They'll be taught by some of the photographers around the city. Um, and they'll also learn writing. So they could actually learn how to write music or write blogs or, or do podcasts uh, and so forth and so on. So this program actually you know, helps them with self-esteem, self-respect, collaborating together. So we did uh, five students today where we met with the parents and talked to them and just did an overview of what it's going to look like. And Thursday, we'll do five more, and we'll have a complete um, program of 10 students that are graduate from this academy after eight weeks. After the eight weeks, we'll take a two-week break, start the academy back up. Those who participated and received their certificate will be able to come back and serve as an ACE influencer who could actually help out and give their expertise and tell what they learned from the previous, uh, pre previous course that they had. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, too, um, every city has adversities, right? Um, but it's how you handle it and overcome adversities. And this city has a great tendency of understanding how to do so. Um, we're a city that's resilient. We have resilient citizens. And we all want to see the common cause of seeing a better city. So just the way that we overcome adversities and able to get on the same page and same accord and work together is telling. And we're definitely setting examples. So I appreciate Mr. that. Mr. Mayor, can I pick it back off of him? Sure you can. As long as there's not no adversities. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what we see, and Brian, from what I'm hearing, you're taking music and merging with education. And, and this is one way of getting our youth more mentally. To me, education is supposed to be fun. And some people, that they don't see it as fun. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Attorney? Mr. Mayo? Thank you. Uh, great job on that, Brian. Keep that up. That's, that looks like something that's going to just take off. Uh, definitely happy Fourth of July to all citizens, and I heard it was a great, great time that everyone had out there. I watched the fireworks from North Main Hill, and I could see every bit of it because <laughs> I couldn't get down there. <laughs> but uh, it was just, it was just awesome. And uh, Candy, keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing. It's going to happen. Just keep putting it out there. It's going to happen, and uh, definitely we're in support for you. And I uh, want to get a shout-out to uh, one of our former ball players, J.C. Cheney, who's doing his first uh, youth basketball camp over at GW. Went, a chance to, went over there had a chance to talk to the kids and share some thoughts with them, and they were a bunch of them. So he uh, deserves a lot of credit, and he has some former players, C.J. Boxdale and uh, uh, Justin Reynolds and uh, a lot of other guys who were – more ball players around here, but that's what it's all about when you're trying to keep things and going, keep our youth involved and keep them going for the summer. And I definitely uh, want to give a shout out and a welcome to our new president at Danville Community College, Dr. Jerry Wallace.
Thank you. Vice Mayor Miller. Yeah, just a question to the city manager. You know, there's about six or eight people have come to me in the last couple of weeks, and I hear, sure all of you have heard this, uh, that Caesars is going to buy the mall and start a casino there. And he gave me a good answer why they can't do that. Can you just? So it's my understanding that the referendum included a, an actual address. So when the citizens voted to approve a casino, it was at a specific address, which is on West Main Street. And so there's no possibility for the casino to be located in any other location except for what was approved by the voters a couple years ago. So Dr. Miller, if I could piggyback off that for council and to citizens in our community, I, I've asked the city manager and city staff to reach out to the mall staff and invite them here to council if they want to do a presentation to council as other citizens do in our community, because that rumor about Caesars taking over the mall is flowing like wildfire. So they're looking into that. Yeah. Uh, additionally, you know, our protocol is, and as the mayor's instructed, we don't argue with people who give public comment. I kept my tongue, bit well. uh, bit it well. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, some of the numbers in this, I'll just say sometimes misinformation happens. Uh, 29,000 deaths from COVID. There's, there's no way you can verify that from the COVID vaccine. Uh, it, it's probably a case of numbers are correct, but presumed conclusions are not. In other words, if a 90 year old in the nursing home has cancer and gets a vaccine and three months later, six months later dies after she's got the vaccine, that was reported by this group. Uh, people that had heart attacks, uh, and got, uh, got the vaccine and then died. Well, I can tell you, coronary disease doesn't, de severe coronary disease doesn't develop overnight. You build it up over years. So they coincidentally got a shot and six months later died. That was counted in these numbers. So it's just that sometimes misinformation gets spread and it's, it's dangerous. Uh, what we do know is over a million people have died of COVID. Probably that many or more are coming in with long, long COVID symptoms which the vaccine can limit. Uh, in other words, the, the chest pain, the, the hair loss, the, the fatigue, the brain fog, all these go on for months after you get COVID. And so this is ongoing. So the ledger for uh, COVID vaccine related problems is small. The ledger for COVID-19 COVID caused mortality fatalities and morbidity sickness is huge. Uh, and on that note, I took my, I went, went with my four-year-old grandson in Charlottesville weekend for last and we went to a vaccine clinic. Finally, finally, he was eligible. He's four years old. So he got his vaccine. There were dozens of children lined up, dozens. And they all, they got their shot, no problem. They didn't whine. They didn't cry like adults did. <laughs> they just, took the shot and went on about their business. So, you know, we need to learn something from our children. Uh, and COVID is still here. The, uh, I got two calls, one yesterday and another um, uh, today. People, my patients are in Myrtle Beach <laughs> requesting the oral treatments. There are treatments now once you get COVID, oral medications you can use to limit the disease. So take advantage of those. But they, they, they went down to the beach, got exposed and they're sick with COVID. So it's still, ha it's still happening. And I heard it, we were on a, call just before I get Department of Medicine call just before I came here to hospital and there's been an uptick again in COVID, number of COVID cases and uh, we expect an uptick tick after the 4th of July surge from that. It may, it won't, hopefully it won't be a very big surge. So be safe. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> Mr. Saunders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, like most people, you know, I too uh, believe in prayer. And if you look at our world, and if you look at, well, the world, to include the United States, obviously, it's a lot going on. It, it, it is a lot going on. You know, you, you have your violence, you have your mental illness, you have, you, you have so much going on, and that it's really time to pray. You know, and I think about our public service, our workers, our firefighters, our volunteer life-saving crew, our police officers, when something happens, we run from it. They run to it, right in the middle of it. And I tell you, I pray for them every day and their families because law enforcement officers, police officers, and others, all public safety workers, couldn't do what they do, okay, if, if 
they did not believe in it and had the commitment, the commitment to do that. So I thank you very, very much. Uh, let me also say to Mr. Hood, you, you're, you're about the quietest man all over the city and so public. <laughs> I mean, I hear your name all the time. You're, you're everywhere. And, and thank you for, for what you do. And to our staff, God, we have a great city. We have a wonderful city. And like all of you, I follow the news nationwide. I look at cities, um, small, large, medium, et cetera, and look at Danville. I am so proud of our city. I am so proud of the people who live here. I really am. I am a lover of people. I don't care where they are, and I pray for them, okay? So as long as we can just get along, we don't have to agree on everything because when two people see everything the same way, one of them's not necessary. We learn from different opinions, okay? So let's keep that going. And finally, and thank you, Mr. Buckner, uh, the museum is owned uh, by the city. And Margaret Riedeville is a fundraiser for them to operate. And I've been there several times. It's a wonderful occasion. And guess what? I have tickets. <laughs> so if anybody <laughs> wants to go, let me know. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> thank, thank you. Mr. Fogler? <clears throat> yeah, I got, I got a handful of things. I'm going to try to run through them real quick. They're all positive things. Uh, first of all is that uh, sign-ups and uh, registration is going on right now um, through August 5th for youth football and cheerleading in the city of Danville. And I want to bring attention to that. I might talk about it probably every meeting between uh, now and then, but youth football and cheerleading uh, ages 5 to 12. Um, if you're interested in, in signing up, it is a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, Councilman Mayo and I talk a whole lot, you know, about my son Kingston. He's in, involved in just about every sport you can think of. But I just love going out there and watching these young men and, and with cheerleading young women and just all of them coming together and working hard. And, and I'm a big advocate for youth sports. I, I know from my own life what it does for you. Um, so for those watching, you know, at home and, and those out here in the audience, if you have a child between the age of 5 and 12, even, you know, if they don't think they're a football player, it's about going out and having fun and being around other kids and learning life lessons. And so if you're interested whatsoever, uh, you can call the phone number 434-799-5214. It's 434-799-5214. Or you can sign up online. Um, and, and I know Mark Aaron will probably do a great job on River City TV pushing information to keep getting that out in front of people, and I'll do my best too. But youth football and cheerleading sign-ups going on right now, and uh, my son will be out there. His team won a championship last year. He told me today he's ready to run it back, so they they want to win it again. But I want to see a whole bunch of kids out there, and it's just so awesome. And speaking of football and youth sports, uh, this last week, um, Kingston was a part of, and I got to see, gosh, it was 100-plus kids. and I don't know how many, a lot of kids out there for Travis Tarpley's uh, football camp. Travis does an awesome job. He's been doing it for several years now. Makes it available to kids for free. Um, but that's done through sponsors and so many people, one of which was Councilman Hood. I know you were a sponsor of it. Thank you for that. Um, and just, again, to see young folks, and I think a week or two before that, the Edmonds family did their camp. Another great camp we went out there for. Uh, Buddy Curry has got his coming up. So just, I mean, a lot of great opportunities for young folks to, to get involved in youth sports and just come together and have fun. And um, so please take advantage of these things. And I want to thank Travis again for, for what he's done and continues to do. It was an awesome camp for those, for those young folks. Uh, this past weekend, as others have already mentioned, what, what an awesome weekend in the city of Danville. Uh, as I mentioned, Friday night I was at the football camp. Saturday night we were at the Otterbots game. They were, uh, or excuse me, that was, well, we were at the game Saturday night. Then we went again Sunday night, uh, the firework night. They were sold out Sunday night, almost 2,600 people, jam-packed fireworks. It was great. Um, and then uh, the 4th of July, a lot of great stuff happening. I think Councilman Buckner, I understand, well, I know it for a fact he was. He was giving out free koozies at different pools around the city and stuff. He's a good dude. And, um, but, uh, you know, the fireworks and everything happening downtown was uh, uh, just uh, awesome. My family and I, we were down there. We were watching them. 
And uh, this show, in my opinion, was probably the best one I've ever seen uh, in Danville. It was awesome. Every time I thought it was done, they ramped it up and they kept going, kept going, kept going. Just a, a really, really great thing. And, and so hats off to all the folks who, who made that happen. The fireworks show was incredible. Lastly, there was an article uh, in the paper a week or so ago, and, and it was really good. And I'm just going to touch on it briefly, but if you get a chance, look it up and read it. It was talking about, and we're all familiar with the price of gasoline and how it's impacting everybody. And it was talking about how it's impacting the government in Pennsylvania County and how their gas bill has doubled this year. And it contrasted that by saying the city's gasoline bill, the city government, public works and all that has actually barely increased because the city uh, buys their gasoline and, and long-term uh, contracts with set rates. And so actually right now the city is paying $2.95 a gallon for diesel, $3.30 a gallon for gasoline. That's through October. After October, it drops to $1.97 a gallon. And that's uh, a credit to... to Rick and, and just everybody, Ken, your whole team, I want to hats off to you. I mean, that is saving the taxpayers, gosh, how much money? And it is a credit to the hard work uh, that, that goes in from our city staff looking out for the taxpayers. And again, after October, they're paying $1.97 a gallon for gasoline. Compare that to what we're paying. Uh, the city is doing a very good job. And so thank you all so much. What We have an amazing staff full of um, hardworking uh, top-notch city employees, and, and I'm grateful uh, to, to have each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lee just led a leeway, Ken, for me to ask you to come to the podium talking about an amazing staff. Introduce two of our new staff members. Uh, one of the, uh, Ken, come on to the podium. We have two new staff members here, and let you introduce them. You two can come forward, please. One beside Bill, please come forward. Department heads to come up as well. Yeah, department heads come up as well. Lee was talking about the football and all of that stuff. This young man that you see coming, yeah, he's the new guy that Lee's talking about. Let Bill introduce him and, and yes, talk please about do him. introduce him to our community. Welcome to Danville, and uh, I know we were going to do this in work session, but let the citizens see since Lee's talking about all that's going on. He's <laughs> 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 and I appreciate it, too. We've been, we've been trying to get the word out about uh, uh, football season. I'd like to introduce Chris Archer. Chris is the division director for uh, youth and adult athletics. Chris has a uh, long history working in Chesapeake with Parks and Recreation Department there. And the last eight years that he was there, he was specifically working in sports and athletics there. They have a very big program there, a lot of top-notch facilities. Uh, we're happy to have Chris here. He's not right about a month and uh, is, has jumped in and, and, like you said, football registration's open, cheerleading's open, and he's, he, we don't have time to talk. He's, he's, got, he's, he's busy working all the time, so we're happy to have Chris here. Chris, anything you want to add to that? Welcome. I just appreciate being here and having the opportunity to, you know, to uh, reimagine that, so no, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> you're learning, you're learning. Welcome. <laughs> Anyone else? I'd like, to also, I'd like to also introduce our department intern. This is Will Davis. Uh, Will is, he's finishing up his coursework in Ferrum and uh, has been with us and we've kind of thrown him right in. He's done everything from working events to the fun wagon to out in the parks. Uh, interesting note I just learned tonight, Will's father worked for Parks and Recreation for many years and uh, Will's here doing his internship with us doing a great job for us. Will, thank you so much. Anything you want to add, Will? I'm just uh, happy to have a chance to, to work where my dad did and carry on, and come back and be able to do something for the city that helped shape me when I grew up. So. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Come on up. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> sent you all an email about this over the weekend, but I'll let uh, I want to introduce you to the citizens of our community. Uh, this is Bart Knuckles. He's our consultant who's going to be helping out with um, Doug Plachinski's resignation as of June 30th. Uh, planning needs a little help, so Bart's going to be filling in. He'll probably be here at the next meeting that we'll have, answering questions and everything else, but I wanted him to get a chance to see how everything operates and get a chance to meet everybody. So. Mark, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. I appreciate we, uh, we're looking forward to being here and helping you out. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so Thanks much. So thank much. you. Before you sit down, city manager, 
I just want to let our citizens know we have a person who's heading off to Harvard. <laughs> Harvard. We're very proud of you, Ken. You want to tell us a little bit about that? We're very proud of you. Very proud of you. That um, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to be admitted into the senior executives and state and local government program uh, that's uh, part of the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, so it's a three week program and I'll be there for the next three weeks after this week. Uh, and I'm looking forward to learning all sorts of things. I've, I've looked at the syllabus. Uh, I'm going to be reading a lot. Uh, and uh, I, I, at one point I looked at it, I thought, I don't know what I got myself into. But uh, I, I, will th I do want to thank the Danville Regional Foundation that supported my application by funding the uh, program for us. So uh, it's, uh, it was great for them to do that. And my understanding is that Clark Castile, who is uh, uh, in charge of the foundation, uh, he'll be there overlapping, doing a different program for one of the weeks that I'm there. So I'll have, well, there'll be some Danville supervision amongst each other uh, while we're out of town. So. <laughs> well, well, we're proud of you, very proud of you. I'm sure your family is. So I'll try, that's three weeks I get to get a break. I don't have, we don't have to be calling each other four times a day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the young man, come to the, uh, Mr. Reynolds, come to the microphone. Uh, come on up to you next. So Earl is gonna be filling in while you're out, correct? Earl, this is be the man. That is correct, yes. Earl, Earl, we had our graduation. Councilman Saunders and I attended the department's fourth annual Youth Police Academy graduation ceremony. And this young man that's standing here is always quiet. He gave an overwhelming speech to our young people, and it was titled Overcoming. And Councilman Saunders and I were taking notes. <laughs> I knew it was for the kids, but we were taking notes. And I just want to say to you, sir, uh, you, you're always quiet and in the background, but that was absolutely one of the best commencement speeches that I, I know was for the young people. And he came, Tommy Bennett, he came from off the stage, and he went right in front of the young people. Councilman Saunders, you want to add anything to this at all? Mr. Mayor, I think you said it all. This man, I wish everyone could have been there to hear, to hear the uh, introduction. All the things that he has done and been involved with, you know, state leadership, <coughs> BML, uh, two master degrees, uh, football player, uh, city manager, uh, assistant city manager in Roanoke, city manager in Martinville. The list goes on and on and on, but you will never, ever know it. So when he was introduced, as the mayor said, he talked to these young people, but he never said a word about himself. Didn't never. mention himself, did not mention his background, did not mention anything. Did not even mention that he went to college because of James Brown, the singer. He was shining Mr. James Brown's shoes at his father's barber shop in Roanoke. And Mr. Brown asked him, what are you playing? And he said, I'm still thinking about that. He said, no, you go back to school, go to college. And he gave him a real nice tip. But he had to say how much the tip was, so I don't blame him at all. But this man did an excellent job. He had the children's attention. And no one would ever know this magnificent background because he's not going to tell you that's the kind of guy he is. And the thing about it is we were sitting beside each other. Whew, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Campbell wants something now, but don't give him none. Go ahead, Councilman Campbell. <laughs> but Earl, we have worked on many projects personally, and I just admire you quite a bit, you know, and you know what my heart is. I just want to wish I could have been there, but I just want to say that the city of Danforth is blessed to have Earl Reynolds here as the deputy city manager. Well, sir, I'm sure Ken has given you the rules that you and I be talking at 4.30 in the morning. And <laughs> but thank you so much. Let's give him a big hand, please. <laughs> to all of our police department, and Sylvia Brooks hate to do this because she wants all of the police department to get credit for um, what took place in our fourth annual Youth Police Academy. It was absolutely phenomenal to all of the sponsors and to all of those persons who donated. There were people who were donating snacks and drinks and food from our community. We want to thank you all as well. It was a great success. Today I had the opportunity to attend 
Miss McDuffie, Miss Flora Hughes McDuffie's 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. It was at the Stratford Inn, and, and I got there today about two o'clock, and this young lady, and I mean young lady, was just so much wisdom she was pouring into me, but to her daughter Diane and Dyron, and you all know Dyron, thank you all so, so much for letting me be a part of that. Lee hit on it. I was also at North Campus for Travis Tarpley's Young People event, and then before that, the Edmonds family, and we were at the Carrington Pavilion with the Edmonds family, and as Lee stated, there's so many things going on in our community with persons getting involved. I thank Councilman Saunders and Councilman um, Vice Mayor for the times that they serve on the school education committee, but Councilman Whittle and Councilman Campbell have opened up the gates running. The education, you're gonna be hearing more about education as Councilman Campbell was stating a few minutes ago about reading. And I know Mildred Richardson, and you all know how I, Mildred and I are, I know Mildred Richardson was jumping up and down when you was talking about reading. Persons don't realize in our community, our kids are having a hard time reading. And please, please take advantage of these programs. So you're gonna be hearing more about education. Councilman Whittle, Councilman Campbell, thank you all so much for what you all have done and what you all are doing. Alex, could you stand up one more time? To have our young adults come back in our community and get as active in our community, and you really touched my heart tonight. I'm sure you touched all council members. And pl please feel free to come back to your council anytime. Thank you so much, appreciate you, thank you. <laughs> Lastly, there is a lot of back to school events um, that we will be attending. On this coming Saturday, there is a group of young adults, I understand, that's going to be having a, a conversation at um, Antonio Fitzgerald's church. There are uh, back to school drives. Thank you to everyone who's trying to help us, as Councilman Saunders stated, education is our number one priority. And whatever you are doing to help us in regards to education, whether it's back to school drives, whether it's having a forum to get the parents involved, whatever you're doing, we need your help and we're so thankful for it. And lastly, Larry, I don't talk about this a lot, but I wanna say it tonight um, to my pastor, I never do this, to Apostle Campbell, I am just so thankful and honored for all that you have bestowed into me. I don't talk about him a lot because in the words of Larry Campbell, Larry always steal my thunder. <laughs> but tonight I just wanna take out time to say to Bishop Campbell, um, I was there, many of you all know I my entire life, I was at Bible Way. And um, Larry and I, we grew up fighting in the sand and everything else. No, we have a wonderful relationship and always have. But when Larry mentioned Councilman Saunders, I wanted to say something last meeting when you talked about at Movement Bank and all the 45 years, 47 years he's been in Movement Bank. Yesterday, someone said to me, I got a call, and they said, can, I, can you talk? I said, sure. And they said, I want to talk about the GOAT. And you know what came on my mind. And I said, what do you mean you want to talk about the GOAT? And they said, they want to talk about this spiritual leader, the greatest of all time. Apostle Campbell, and they talked about this speaking on this past Sunday, and it touched Larry the city. He really touched this city. And so we must say, Apostle Campbell, if you're watching, we appreciate you and all that you're doing and all that you will be doing. And on this note, we are adjourned. <laughs>